have your Bibles with you this morning or on you, I invite you to find uh, two passages, actually. Uh, we're going to be looking at two New Testament gospel passages. The first one is going to be Mark chapter 6. That's where we're going to be uh, finding our, our main text. But then also, if you would, go ahead and flip over and find Matthew 11 and stick your finger in it. Or if you have one of those, uh, those Bible ribbons, uh, in, that's, that's what makes the difference between a gift and an award Bible and a Bible you buy. The, 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 the investment Bible has ribbons in it, and uh, mine has three. So boom. All right. Anyway, so, uh, but no, if you've, got, if you've got a ribbon or a bookmark or something, go ahead and put in Matthew chapter 11. Uh, we're going to be looking at that as well because as I mentioned to the kids, we're going to be looking at uh, the person of John the Baptist today. Uh, primarily his relationship to Jesus, being the cousin of Jesus, but also um, his, how he, he related in his faith toward Jesus as well. Because John the Baptist is an interesting figure. And I believe that the, the reason that the Word gives us uh, these, these case studies or these character studies in Scripture is so that we can learn from them, but also so that we can see a little bit of ourselves in them as well. I mean, have you ever, you ever just studied someone in Scripture and you find yourself like, man, I think I really identify with this person, right? Um, hopefully you're not identifying with the villains, but, um, but you know, that's, that's between you and the Lord. But um, I mean, I hope nobody reads through and says, man, I really identify with Jezebel. I really, really do. Um, you know, if that's the case, uh, the altar will be open at the end of the service. Uh, so, <clears throat> but, uh, but anyway, or, or come now because you need it. Uh, either way, so <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Um, like Pastor Chris uh, mentioned uh, last Sunday, we're taking a little bit of a more of a topical spin or a topical approach to uh, the messages through the month of September and October. We're going to be looking at uh, going into a little bit of a, a of a different uh, kind of uh, kind of angle as well. But we've been going through the book of Isaiah, and we kind of came to the end of that first section of Isaiah, and, and plan, Lord willing, as the Lord guides, to return to that somewhere around Christmas time, the, the end of Isaiah, because there's so much messianic depth in there. But over the next couple of weeks, uh, as I'll be preaching, we're going to be looking and dealing uh, with this simple question is, what do I do, or how do I function in my faith when God doesn't seem like he's making sense? Has anybody ever been there before? Like, you know you're in church and you don't want the roof to cave in because you don't want to look like you're not faithful. But let's be honest, sometimes following Christ, obeying him, trusting him for the next day or trusting him for the next moment or trusting that what he's doing or not doing is what's best for me, it's difficult, isn't it? Or am I the only one? It's, it's tough. This is why the Bible says that this is a narrow path. And not many people want to walk on it because it doesn't make sense a lot of times. The Bible says that if we are following him, we look like fools to the rest of those who perish. So it doesn't make sense logically sometimes the things that we believe and the fact that we would follow him and trust him even when it seems like everything's falling apart. So that's what I want to look at this week and, 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 and next Sunday as I preach as well. We'll be looking at another, at another case study of, of another person in Scripture. But today is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is a very interesting kind of, uh, kind of guy because he was all in with Christ. I mean, he was all in. We saw that with the kids just a moment ago. There was a man that was sent from God and his name was John. Now, if that's the description of you, you better do what God says. If God sent you for a purpose, you better do what God says. And John the Baptist was sent to be the forerunner or to tell people that the light of the world has come. That's the whole purpose that he was there. And he had one message, and it was repent because the Savior is about to arrive. That's a pretty simple job. Matter of fact, if we line that up with what the Great Commission says, isn't that really our job as well? It may not be repent, turn or burn type of thing, but uh, it's go and tell the world that Jesus saves. Go and tell the world that there is a Savior. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's our job as well. It's not that much, that much different. But there are a lot of times that we look at the word and we look at the, the faith that we preach and the faith that we follow and we think, God, do you see what's going on? Sometimes we wonder, God, we're trying our best to be faithful. We're trying our best to preach the gospel. We're trying our best to do what's right and to trust you. But some of the times the, the roads that you lead me down are difficult. And I just don't think that if you were there and if you loved me the way that you say you do, I don't know if this is the road that you would lead me down. Because there's tough questions, right? I bet right now if, if we weren't in Lexington, Kentucky, but we were down in Florida, 
in the remnants of, of the hurricane that happened this week, we'd be struggling with this question a little bit more. Or if we lived in Maui, and we were digging through the ashes and the, and the rubble heap of what used to be a good life, and thinking, man, what's left? We'd be asking God, where were you to stop the fire? Where were you with the hurricane? If you are over the wind and the waves, if you are over everything, if you are over your creation, why do you allow this to happen? Why can't you stop it? And folks, that's a question that people outside of the church have been asking for centuries. If God is really good, then why do bad things happen to such good people? And there are people within the church today, too, or on the verge of just saying, you know what? I just can't, I can't seem to rationalize a good and loving God that allows so much pain and suffering that would allow a sweet woman just of 60 years old to be taken just like that. Or it's the funeral that I preached just yesterday of a young man of 22 years old who was born with muscular dystrophy. And you look at that and you think, man, why didn't God step in or stop that, right? We don't understand that sometimes. Because here's the truth. We live in a broken and chaotic world. And all we want is just a moment of peace. We want to make sense of the problems. We want to make sense of the tragedy. We want to make sense of all those things. And for the church, the way we make sense of it is a good and loving God who loves us, right? But sometimes we wonder, God, if you, if, if, if you really truly love me, why is some of this stuff happening? John the Baptist is one of those guys who probably had those thoughts. We saw a little bit with the kids what the first part of his life was about, but we're going to focus on the last month or six weeks of his life, depending on the timeline of everything. And John the Baptist's life was just, it was exemplary to all of us. He spent his life preaching and teaching the Word of God and telling people, hey, you need to repent for Jesus Christ is coming. Let me ask you this question. Maybe you've been in the point in your life where you've prayed, and I mean you have prayed. Maybe not sweat drops of blood, but you've put in the work of prayer, and you've prayed in all faith, and it doesn't seem like God was listening. You know how you want God to work, and it just doesn't seem like he's answering the way you want. You're there, your heart is poured open, you're on your face before God, and you're crying out to him in desperation, and it's like crickets, man. That's all you're getting. Anybody ever been there before? Or it seemed like maybe God was uncooperative, maybe. You, you know, a lot of people say they've been there before. You asked God to do this, and he did this instead. And what makes matters worse is when you come into uh, the household of faith and you hear other people talking about how God's blessing their socks off and you're thinking, man, I, I, can I get just a little bit of that? Just a, just a little bit? And you're thinking, hey God, I'm over here. Maybe you've missed me. I know I'm not as tall as some of those other people. Maybe you just missed me. I'm, I'm still here. But we trust that God's an omniscient, all-knowing, all-present, all-faithful God, right? So here's here's... Here's the idea that, here's one of the truths that we have to understand going into this message. Is it just because you believe that Christ and know that Christ is the answer doesn't mean that you're going to struggle with questions about him. Doesn't mean that we're not going to struggle with questions about him. Just because you've trusted Christ as to be the answer and to be the savior of your life and the one who makes sense of it all doesn't mean you're not going to struggle with questions about him. Everyone in scripture struggled with questions. These giants of the faith that we see in scripture, matter of fact, over in Hebrews, in Hebrews 11 where you see the hall of faith, every one of those folks struggled with this question. God, I don't know if I can trust you. How far can I go in my faith? Because if faith weren't faith, or faith wasn't faith, we wouldn't have to have faith. Does that make sense? See, if faith was easy, it wouldn't be faith. So that's what I want to focus on today. What do I do when it doesn't seem like God is paying attention? So John the Baptist, what do we know about him? John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus Christ. They were really close to the same age. John was just about a few months older than Jesus was. Matter of fact, Mary and Elizabeth, they both kind of hung out together uh, when they were both pregnant. The Bible said that when Mary showed up and she was pregnant, that John the Baptist like leaped inside of the womb of, uh, of Elizabeth. And, and they just, they hung out and they had their, uh, you know, they, they read, uh, you know, what to expect when you're expecting and stuff like that together. And they went to Lamaze classes and prenatal stuff and all that type of stuff, right? John and Jesus would probably see each other at holidays and funerals and family reunions and things like that. John the Baptist was a, an off-the-grid kind of guy. The Bible says that he wore, he wore animal skins and he ate locusts and he just lived out in the middle of the wilderness. All right, so he was kind of like, uh, you know, when I picture John the Baptist, anybody remember the Duck Dynasty guys, the Robertson family? Y'all remember Uncle Cy? 
that guy right there, y'all remember him? This is how I picture John the Baptist, you know, walking around with his beard, he's got his camo on, he's got his sweet, he's got his tea sweetened with wild honey, of course. You know, the Bible said he ate locusts and wild honey, so he's, he's picking, you know, insect legs out of his beard and stuff. That's just kind of how I pictured John the Baptist. Matter of fact, if you're there and you're listening to a message by a guy like that, I'm going to do whatever he says at invitation time. <laughs> whatever he says. But this is kind of the guy that John the Baptist was, and he had one message and one message only, and it was repent and be baptized because the day of the Messiah is drawing near. John declared to the world when Jesus came. John was the one who was able to actually baptize Jesus. And when, John, when Jesus came to be baptized to begin his earthly minister, ministry, John the Baptist said, there is the one. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is why John the Baptist was put on the planet. He was put on the planet to point to the Savior. And all that believing and faithful service, you would think that it would pay off for him. But in earthly speaking, it got him into a lot of trouble. And that's where we're going to pick up our text this morning in the story. Let's look at Mark chapter 16, verse number 17. And it says this, For Herod himself had given orders to arrest John. <laughs> all that preaching, all that teaching, all that living on the grid, all that, all that special diet, all that sacrifice, what did it lead to? He landed him in jail. So he arrested John and he chained him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Now there's another person. You don't want to identify with Herodias. You really don't. We're going to find out why. Here's the minute. Because he had married her. John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias held a grudge against him and he wanted to kill him, but she couldn't because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. And when Herod heard him, he would be very perplexed, yet he liked to listen to him. John the Baptist just kind of interested Herod. He didn't like what he had to say, but he's like, man, I, I just can't stop hearing what he says. So here's what we have with John, who's a preacher known for telling it like it is. He doesn't pull any punches. You know, he's probably one of those windsucker kind of preachers, you know. Has no filter at all. Can anybody relate with that? He lands himself in prison because he got up into the personal business of Herod Antipas. And what Herod had done was, he was a married man, but apparently he wasn't a happily married man because he started to, you know, be attracted to his brother's sister. And so he's like, you know, I'm the king. And so he divorces his wife, and I don't know what happens to, to, to Philip, but anyway, Herodias and, and, uh, and Herod end up married, okay? And John the Baptist is like, not only is that, is that just gross, but it's not biblical, and it's not God-honoring. And John's talking about that, and he's using those as examples as he's preaching, and um, it's a pretty big scandal, and just like with any pretty big royal scandal, everybody's talking about it. And Herod hears about John the Baptist talking about this as he's preaching and in his ministry. And all of a sudden, Herodias is mad about this. And she's like, I'm the new queen. And so she's running around the palace screaming off with his head and wanting him to be killed because it's an act of treason to speak against the king. But Herod is like, I kind of like the guy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock him up so he can't be poisoning people against us. And I'm just going to keep him around here. And every once in a while, when I want to be entertained, I'm going to pull him out of prison. I'm going to have him talk to me a little bit. How do you think that helped the, the honeymoon phase? When the first thing that, she, that, that the new wife asks is, I need you to kill this guy for me. And he's like, I don't think I'm going to do that. I don't think the honeymoon phase lasted very long. So, which this in and of itself is pretty miraculous. The fact that John held on to his life as long as he did is a miracle of God. Because in those days, treason was instant execution, but for some reason, God had put it in, 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 in Herod's heart, like, I'm going to just keep him around for a little while. And here's the truth that we have to note, that we have to take with us here. What do we learn from this? Is that sometimes as we serve God and we're doing all the right things, it can still land us in trouble. Sometimes as we serve the Lord, it's going to lead to trouble and to suffering for him. God never promised that the path would be easy. What he did promise was that we would never walk alone on that path. If somebody told you one day, hey, you come and you, you get saved and you put your faith and, tr and trust in Christ and you become a member of our church, everything's going to get good, man. All your debt's going to go away. All your problems are going to go away. You're going to get six-pack abs overnight, which never happens. All that's going to happen for you. They lied to you. Because following Christ means denying ourselves. This is why Christ talks about deny myself, take up your cross, and follow me. What he's saying is, as you follow me, it's going to lead to trouble. 
And John the Baptist is sitting in prison realizing that that's absolutely true at this point. And he has to be thinking that he knows where this is going. The longer I sit in here, the shorter of time I have to live. If I stay in here, I'm going to lose my head. So what does he do? He sends word to his cousin Jesus. And he's got to be thinking, Jesus is going to get me out. I mean, we're cousins. We're tight. You know, mom and uh, our moms were like, you know, they were Lamaze partners and stuff. And they, they, we go way back. Jesus is going to help me out because he's out there turning water to wine. He's walking on water. A jailbreak is not going to be a big deal. He's thinking, I just got to send word to Jesus and let him know about that. But days and weeks pass and nothing. And over in Matthew chapter 11, we see what John actually does. He finally decides, I'm going to send a letter over to Jesus, and I'm going to let him know that I need to be released for prison. Now look at Matthew chapter 11, verse number 2. It says, now when John heard in prison what the Christ was doing, he sent a message through his disciples, and he asked him, are you the one to come, or should we expect somebody else? Do you catch the snark in that question? Do you catch the lack, the, the, the beginning to like, I don't know. What's he saying? I've been preaching my whole life telling people that you're the Messiah, but now when I need you to do Messiah things for me, you're not. So are you really the Messiah or not? John the Baptist, who led so many people to faith in Christ, is now having his own personal crisis of faith. It doesn't matter who we are, and it doesn't matter how long that we've been following the Lord, we are going to have crisis of faith. And these are opportunities for Christ to show himself faithful to us, but it's also opportunities for us to understand that he's in control and that he is sovereign and that he is Lord and we are not. See, he's like, are you the one who is to come? I've been out here paving the way for you, Jesus, and you're out there having a good time and now I'm in prison and it really doesn't make sense. He says, are you really the Messiah? Because I would think that if you are really the Messiah and if I'm supposed to be out there announcing your arrival, you'd probably get me out of prison and do me a solid here. And let's not look at John the Baptist and say, man, what, a, what an immature believer. I would never think that about Jesus. I would never, th- I'm just a, nothing but a servant, 100% a servant's heart all the time. We don't live like that either. You ever been tempted to look around and think, God, man, I've been following you for years. And there are some places where I thought you really could have come through and you, you, you chose not to. And it begins to make us wonder, is it really worth it? Maybe it hasn't been a prison thing. Maybe none of you have been sitting in prison thinking, God, are you going to release me? But you've been putting in the work of faith and it just doesn't look like God's paying attention because if he did, you wouldn't be in the spot that you're in and we can't forget that truth. Sometimes serving God leads to suffering for him and in that suffering it gets easy to start wondering why God would allow it why doesn't he fix it why doesn't he end the suffering because if he loves me why would he want to see me suffer like I am now look at Jesus's response because if you've ever heard of insult to injury here we go then Jesus replied to them the ones who sent the letter and he says go and report to John what you hear and see The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor are told the good news, and blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. And Jesus looks at him and says, okay, you can go back and tell John now. Doesn't even, doesn't even like acknowledge John's situation. John, I know this must be a hard time for you. No, go back and tell John how good things are going out here. John's like, that's great, I'd like to be part of it, Right? Now, this right here doesn't line up with our American cultural Christian, sometimes poisoned by prosperity gospel kind of thinking, where we think that faith is more of a transactional thing. If I invest this, I'm going to get this back. No, faith is a I die and I follow the one who raised me again. That, that's, that's what faith is. You'd expect Jesus to say, okay, go back and tell John, you know, wait three more days. In about three more days, you know, the, the little spokes on the, on the jail cell are going to come off. The guards are going to fall down like dead men. It's going to be like pause in the matrix. and You're going to be able to walk through and everybody's frozen. They don't even see you. Go ahead and grab a bag of gold from the treasury on the way out too. It's just kind of a payment for all the faithfulness you've given me. That's not what Jesus says. That's not what Jesus says at all. Basically what Jesus is saying here is, look, John, everything you pay for the way everything you've paved the way for people to see is happening right now. So he's like, good job. Keep the faith. Okay, great. I hear they're serving potatoes tonight in prison. I hope you enjoy them. 
It just doesn't seem to make sense, right? No promise of deliverance, no promise of escape. Just good job, hang in there. And that leads us to the next uncomfortable point, is that, yes, serving God, it can lead to, can lead to suffering, but the next uh, undeniable point that we have to understand is this, is that sometimes God is silent when we are in the suffering. One of the things that makes the suffering so difficult is feeling like, God, are you hearing me? Because what we're doing is we're basing God hearing on us, hearing us on whether he's done what we've asked him to do. God is always hearing, but it sometimes seems like God is silent with his servants. God wanted to know if Jesus was truly the Messiah. Why? Because in John's mind, nothing was making sense to him. He'd done everything he was supposed to do, and he was being rewarded with prison. So let's get back over to Mark chapter 6 and pick up the story to see how the rest of it goes, because it's going to take a turn. I hope you're ready. Remember, John's in prison, and now it doesn't look like Jesus is going to be coming to break him out. It doesn't look like Jesus is going to be performing any miracles for him and in his, uh, and, and in his honor. Herodias wants him dead. It's mounting every day. She's, she's really ticked off. She started campaigns with everybody to try to get him killed. And in Mark chapter 6, verse 21, we picked, up, picked this up. An opportune time came on Herod's birthday. When Herod gave a banquet for his nobles, his military commanders, the leading men of Galilee. When Herodias' own daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. The king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. He promised her with an oath in front of everyone. Whatever you ask me, I'll give you, even up to half of my kingdom. I'm going to give you partner stock in my kingdom. Whatever you want. So Herod has this birthday party, and all the heads of state are there, and it's a rager. Everybody's having a great time. And, and, and what happens? Herodias sends her daughter, who, remember the relationship, it's, they're married because they're, they, were, they were in-laws, right? So this makes Herodias Herod's niece. I mean, we're talking like Kentucky, like... <laughs> we understand this, Unfortunately. Okay, just as long as we're tracking. She comes in and she dances, and there's kids in here, so it's probably a beautiful piece from Swan Lake, okay? <laughs> and, and, and Herod is a huge ballet fan, okay? So he's like, this is great. This is the most beautiful rendition of Swan Lake I've ever seen. And he's like, I'm going to reward you with whatever you would want. And she's a teenage girl, so she's like, I, I, don't, I don't know what to get. And she's like, I don't know, maybe a, a pony, a, a new chariot, an iPhone, Taylor Swift tickets. I don't know what I would have. And so the girl starts wondering, what should I get? So she goes and she asks her mother in verse 24. She goes out and she asks her mother, what should I ask for? And what does Herodias want for her daughter? What every teenage girl wants, the head of a preacher. <laughs> I want John the Baptist's head, she said. At once, she hurried into the king and said, I want you to give me John the Baptist's head on a platter immediately. Wait a minute, if we're not careful, it might look like Herodias set this thing up. And all of a sudden, in front of the whole room of nobles and bigwigs, Herod's put on the spot. Is he going to be a man of his word? Is he going to keep his promise? And in verse 26, it says, Although the king was deeply distressed because of his oaths and the guest, he did not want to refuse her. The king immediately sent for an executioner and commanded him to bring John's head. So they went and they beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and then the girl gave it to her mother. And here's one of the saddest things in verse 29. And when John's disciples heard about it, they came and they removed his body and they placed it in a tomb. And that's it. Like, pull the curtain, end scene. That's John the Baptist's life right there. That's how it ends. It's not quite the story of victory and triumph that we would hope such a faithful man of God would see. In fact, he'd been faithful. He even, he even asked Jesus, did Jesus have the means to let him escape? Yes. Did Jesus have the power? Yes. But for some reason, he chose not to make that happen. I mean, this guy was put on the planet to pave the way for Jesus, and he does it in a big way. Later on, Jesus would be asked, and Jesus would say, John the Baptist is the greatest preacher that has ever lived. This is how much respect that Jesus had for him. But for some reason, this just doesn't make any sense, does it? He dies a prisoner's death, carried off in the shadows, buried in a, in a nameless tomb with no fanfare, no funeral, no eulogy, nothing. 
See, I mean, if you look at all this, you have to think this could have been prevented. Jesus could have done something. And some of us may be so bold as to say Jesus should have done something. And, and when you consider the one thing that Jesus did say to him, <laughs> man, things are going good, John. It seems like, man, does Jesus even care? How is that a loving Savior right there? You might even be thinking or feeling like what's going on in your life right now, you identify with this. You feel like you're up against it. You feel like you've begged and begged and begged, and it's so obvious to you what God needs to do, but why isn't it obvious to him? Because if it was obvious to him, he would go ahead and do it. But if John the Baptist could be in that spot, we shouldn't be so bold as to think or arrogant as to think that we don't deserve to be in that spot. And if God is still good in spite of John the Baptist, he's still good in spite of us. So we've looked at two pretty dark truths. I want to look at, some, look at something interesting now. But truth number three is that God's purpose is more perfect than our plans. Yes, we may suffer for following him. And yes, it may not go the way that we want. But his purpose is perfect. Our plans are often flawed. They're often flawed. Remember in Matthew chapter 11 when Jesus said, blessed is the one who isn't offended by me? Remember that passage right there? That word offended in the Greek is skandalizo. It means, it's where we get our word from being scandalized. It means that I am just literally, uh, it means to cause somebody to trip up or cause somebody to stumble. What Jesus was literally saying to John the Baptist is, blessed or happy is the person who doesn't get tripped up by my ways. Who, who, doesn't, who doesn't doubt that, who continues to trust me even though I look like I'm not very trustworthy. And sometimes that's what God calls us to do. We need to trust him even though everyone around us, and it doesn't make any sense why we should, we still trust him through that. And I think that's an interesting word, choice of words that, that Jesus used. Blessed is the one who's not scandalized by me. Because sometimes our faith takes us to a place where we're tempted to be scandalized by him. And what he's saying here is a truth that we have to grasp and we have to grasp onto it hard is that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. Is he the lover of your soul? Yes. Is he the redeemer of our sin? Yes. But he is still the Lord Jesus Christ. His job as Lord is to lead us like a shepherd. And our job as a disciple is to follow him is to follow him faithfully wherever he leads and through whatever valley he may lead. And there's going to be times when he leads down paths where it's hard to follow him. And at that moment, we have to choose whether or not we're going to continue to obey him or whether we're going to be scandalized by him and go the other way. And this happened all the time in Christ's ministry. You remember back when Jesus fed the 5,000? Everybody was happy about that. You know, there was only five. That, that was back when they only counted men. So there had to have been, could have been fifteen to 20,000 people that he fed with fish and bread, Right? You know what happened the next morning after that miracle? Everybody shows back up because what happened? They got full, but now they're hungry again, and it's time for breakfast. And they're like, let's go over and see what Jesus is putting out at Golden Corral today. And Jesus is like, I got nothing for you, except for that you partake of me, my flesh and my blood. And the Bible says there, that the Bible says in that passage that people says, this is too hard of a teaching. It says, every one of them turned and they walked away. See, they were scandalized by what Christ had said. They were scandalized by the way Christ was leading at that point. We have a choice. Will we be scandalized or will we stay? And, and the beautiful side in that picture is, is Jesus turns around and I picture it as the disciples are standing behind him watching everybody leave and he turns around to his disciples who stayed there and he said, are you all going to go too? And Peter looks at him and says, Lord, where are we going to go? Because you are the only one who has the words of life. You are the only one. Even though everything falls apart. Is this the faith that we have? That even though everything may be falling apart and everything may be looking like it's leading to death, but you have that faith in Jesus that I can't leave you because you're the only one who gives me life to begin with. I can't walk away from you. It's telling us that we've got all of our plans. We've got all of our ideas of what it should look like to be happy and blessed, right? Right? But here's what the book of Proverbs tells us. It says that many are the plans in the mind of a man. Many are the plans in the mind of humanity, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. It means go ahead and make your plans. There's nothing wrong with that. But understand that God's will trumps everything. God's will trumps all of it, and that's what will stand. 
means I've got an idea of how I think things should go and what God's goodness should actually look like in my life, but it is the purpose, it's the decree, it's the orders of God that stands. God's working his purpose, he's working his plan, and it's bigger than our own. It is. See, for Christians, we have to accept that Jesus is actually the main character of our life story. That we're not the main character. I mean, we live in a culture where everybody's vying to be the main character. Aren't we? It, 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 our Instagram accounts, Facebook accounts, all that stuff. We want everybody to know who we are, what we do, what we think at any given moment. And, and for some reason, we have this urge to tell everybody what we're eating at every meal. Posting pictures of it all the time. I don't care. If you didn't invite me, I don't care. <laughs> Unless you're cooking it for me, I'm happy for you. But eat your filet mignon in peace while I go over here and eat my PB&J. All right? But seriously, this is, this is what we struggle with. We struggle with, and this is what the flesh tells us. The flesh tells me I have to be the superstar. I have to be the leader. This is what caused Adam and Eve to sin to begin with. I have to be God. I have to be the one. But what Jesus was telling John the Baptist is, no, you were the forerunner of me. You were the one to point people to me. And John the Baptist, you've done a great job, but your job is done. And are we okay with not being the main character in our life story? Can we settle for being second or even third or a, lot, a little bit further down the list? See, the blessing is not really defined by the moments that it seems like his plans are agreeable to our request. The blessing is in the fact that he calls us to take part in his purpose to begin with. See, back in John chapter 1 when it says there was a man sent by God whose name was John. It could have very well easily been there was a man sent by God whose name was Jesse or a man sent by God whose name, it didn't have to be John the Baptist, but God chose John the Baptist for that. And church, what we have to understand is God chooses to use us to glorify him. We don't deserve it. We just don't. I was talking uh, in a conversation this morning with some guys, and one of the guys popped up and said, you know, the best way to describe our church is we're like the island of misfit toys. <laughs> really, when we think about what do we have to offer of huge significance, some of us are, some of us are great singers, some of us are great with computers, or great with words, or great with, and those are all things, but those are all wonderful things, but they pale in comparison to the eternal power and might and glory of our God. We don't rival him, folks. But boy, we'll spend our entire life trying to and fall on our face every time. See, our plans may be big plans, but it's his decree, it's his law, it's his will that we'll pursue. Look over at Matthew chapter 11 one more time. Unless we are left to think about Jesus just not caring about John. I want you to look at verse number 7. And this one, guys, I don't think is on the screen, so don't worry about that. John chapter 11, verse number 7. Or, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 11, verse number 7. It says, as these men were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. He said, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaking in the wind? And what did you go out to see? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? See, those who wear soft clothes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one who, about whom it was written, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and the violent have been seizing it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Let anyone who has ears listen. Listen, he may not have had a funeral, but boy, he got eulogized, didn't he? And he was eulogized by the one that he came to serve and the one he came to proclaim. Jesus' eyes were not turned from John the Baptist. Jesus' eyes were on John the Baptist from before John the Baptist was born, just as his eyes are on us from the moment before we're born. He has a purpose and a plan, and his purpose will be carried out. The question is, will we surrender to his purpose and in that find our life's meaning and find joy? 
For John, the greatest part of the story wasn't in the way it ended. The greatest part of his story was in the fact that he was able to tell people about Christ. He was, he, it was the fact that he had a purpose, that God had chosen him to prepare the way and to point to Christ. And for us, we have to understand the same thing. We know that the greatest compliment we can ever hear when we stand before God after we draw our last breath is what? Enter in, good and faithful servant. Well done. We get there by putting ourselves in second place and surrendering ourselves to glorifying and magnifying Jesus. And this idea that God's not good if he doesn't do good to me, we've got to let go of that. And the last thing, very quickly, because I know our attention spans can be short sometimes. God's silence doesn't mean he's absent. God's silence does not mean that he is absent. Just because you may not feel like you're hearing him doesn't mean that he's not hearing you. He hears every prayer. He knows every hair on our head. He catches every tear in a bottle. He knows us. He knows what we're thinking. He knows how we feel. And just because you don't see evidence of immediate deliverance doesn't mean that he is not with you the entire time through that. See, the beautiful thing about this is while John died there in Herodias' palace, Jesus' heart was with him. While you are going through the valley of the shadow of death, guess what? The shepherd is with you. His rod and his staff, it comforts you. He's with you. He may not always deliver you because he may know that immediate deliverance is not what you need for your faith. And that's hard to hear. It's hard. And it's hard to rationalize, especially when you're in the middle of the valley. But God's silence doesn't always mean that he's absent. Go back to Matthew 11 for just one more second. I want to see Christ's response to John. When we looked at it, we thought, man, how... How insensitive can that be? Let's look at it from another, another perspective. Verse number four. Jesus replied to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind are receiving sight. The lame are walking. Those with leprosy are cleansed. The deaf are hearing. The dead are raised. And the poor are told the good news. Note here that every single one of these people, one of the things that Jesus said, every one of them were being broken out of some personal form of prison, weren't they? Right? The blind were imprisoned by darkness. They were now given sight. The cripples who were imprisoned by their mats or their, or, or their wheelchairs or whatever it may have been, they were now made to walk. The lepers who were crippled and in a prison of could never come around anyone, could never come within like 10 yards of somebody, they were now brought out of that prison and could now find community among their families again and they were cleansed. The deaf who were in a prison of silence were now given the ability to hear. And what's the next one? What does it say? The dead are raised. This is the one that's going to apply to John the Baptist, right? It's almost like Jesus is saying, look, I'm going, to st- I'm going to get you out of there, John, but I'm going to get you out of there in a way that you may not be thinking is the best way. Because, John, you're in a prison, but you're in a prison that's much bigger than the one that's got you in bars. See, we're all in this prison. We're in this prison of sin and death and separation from God, and we are, we are imprisoned by that. But Jesus Christ, because of his mercy and goodness and power to save, breaks those shackles and breaks those chains. He breaks us out of prison. He raises us from spiritual death to spiritual life. And he says this, he says, John, if you believe me, if you trust me, you will be raised. So don't be scandalized by my apparent silence here, John, because there's a bigger picture at play. There's a bigger miracle that's going to happen is when you draw your last breath here on earth, you are going to be free from the prison of sin, the prison of pain, the prison of torment. You're going to be with the Father. So the lesson we get from that is don't find fuel for our faith in just what Jesus is doing lately. Find the fuel for your faith in what he has already done and who he is to you. Just because Jesus didn't come through and and, and break John out of prison didn't change the fact that Jesus was the Savior. And just because you're struggling right now and you're in a place where, man, I really wish he would move, doesn't mean that he's not the Savior and that he's not the Messiah. And right now, that's where some of us need to be encouraged today because you're you're sitting here thinking, man, that preach is good and that's wonderful as red meat to throw out to a church, Pastor, but you have no idea what I'm going through right now. I may not, but Jesus does. He does. And you may want to even laugh at that statement. If he did, 
he'd be doing something. I want to promise you that he is doing something. And I want to tell you this too. He's already done the best thing by giving himself so you could have eternal life. So you could have an eternity that is so much better than this life that we live now. I want to offer you the words and the promise of Christ before we close. He says this in John chapter 16, verse 33. So I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Jesus said it. Jesus is honest, right? But be courageous because I have conquered and overcome that world. In me you will have suffering. You follow me, you'll have suffering. But in me you also have the conquering verdict. That suffering will not last forever. That suffering will end and it will all be made, it will, it'll all make sense when we see him face to face. And this is what it all comes down to. Will we believe that? Will we place our faith and trust in a Savior that we can't see, smell, tuss, taste, taste, or touch, but we know is there? You put your plans aside and trust his purpose, knowing that he never leaves us or never forsakes us. He makes beauty out of the ashes and he redeems every broken thing. He doesn't waste our tears. He doesn't waste the years that the locusts ate. He's working in the midst of our sorrow. The question is, will you trust him? As we bow our heads and as we close our eyes this morning, I just got three questions for you. We're going to have a time of response. What do we do with this? How do I respond to this challenge that I get from John the Baptist's life? If you're here and you don't tr- if you've never trusted Christ, here's the question. Can you place that faith in Christ to be your Savior? Can you do that? Can you trust him with everything, even though he doesn't promise you sunshine and roses every moment of your life? Can you trust him that he is good and that he is making all things right? If you can trust him and follow him, come today to follow him and trust him. For the believer who is struggling, can you continue in faith realizing that your plans are secondary to his will? That's the surrender part to the fact that he's Lord. And for the church, can we just take that commission that John had to go into the darkness and just tell people that the light of the world has come? So there's a commission in that that we really didn't touch on. Who needs to know about this Savior? That maybe we've been too busy really feeling sorry for ourselves, that things aren't going the way we'd like them to, that we just become silent about God. Father, I pray that you would speak now in this time, and I pray that you would move